too. I want now to tell you, gentlemen, whether you care to hear it or not, why I could not even become an insect. I tell you solemnly that I have many times tried to become an insect, but I was not equal even to that. I swear, gentlemen, that to be too conscious is an illness, a real thoroughgoing illness. For man's everyday needs, it would have been quite enough to have the ordinary human consciousness, that is, half or a quarter of the amount which falls to the lot of a cultivated man of our unhappy nineteenth century, especially one who has the fatal ill luck to inhabit Petersburg, the most theoretical and intentional town on the whole terrestrial globe. There are intentional and unintentional towns. It would have been quite enough, for instance, to have the consciousness by which all so-called direct persons and men of action live. I bet you think I am writing all this from affectation, to be witty at the expense of men of action, and what is more, that from ill-bred affectation I am clanking a sword like my officer. But, gentlemen, whoever can pride himself on his diseases and even swagger over them? Though, after all, everyone does do that. People do pride themselves on their diseases, and I do, maybe, more than anyone. We will not dispute it. My contention was absurd, but yet I am firmly persuaded that a great deal of consciousness, every sort of consciousness, in fact, is a disease. I stick to that. Let us leave that, too, for a minute. Tell me this. Why does it happen that at the very, yes, at the very moments when I am most capable of feeling every refinement of all that is sublime and beautiful, as they used to say at one time, it would, as though of design, happen to me not only to feel but to do such ugly things, such that, well, in short, actions that all, perhaps, commit, but which, as though purposely, occurred to me at that very time when I was most conscious that they ought not to be committed. The more conscious I was of goodness and of all that was sublime and beautiful, the more deeply I sank into my mire, and the more ready I was to sink in it altogether. But the chief point was that all this was, as it were, not accidental in me, but as though it were bound to be so. It was as though it were my most normal condition, and not in the least disease or depravity, so that at last all desire in me to struggle against this depravity passed. It ended by my almost believing, perhaps actually believing, that this was perhaps my normal condition. But at first, in the beginning, what agonies I endured in that struggle! I did not believe it was the same with other people, and all my life I hid this fact about myself as a secret. I was ashamed, even now perhaps I am ashamed. I got to the point of feeling a sort of secret, abnormal, despicable enjoyment in returning home to my corner on some disgusting Petersburg night, acutely conscious that that day I had committed a loathsome action again, that what was done could never be undone, and secretly, inwardly gnawing, gnawing at myself for it, tearing and consuming myself till at last the bitterness turned into a sort of shameful accursed sweetness and at last into positive real enjoyment yes into enjoyment into enjoyment i insist upon that i have spoken of this because i keep wanting to know for a fact whether other people feel such enjoyment i will explain the enjoyment was just from the too intense consciousness of one's own degradation. It was from feeling oneself that one had reached the last barrier, that it was horrible, but that it could not be otherwise, that there was no escape for you, that you never could become a different man, that even if time and faith were still left you to change into something different, you would most likely not wish to change or if you did wish to, even then you would do nothing, because perhaps in reality there was nothing for you to change into. And the worst of it was, and the root of it all, that it was all in accord with the normal fundamental laws of over-acute consciousness, and with the inertia that was the direct result of those laws, and that consequently one was not only unable to change, but could do absolutely nothing. 
Thus it would follow, as the result of acute consciousness, that one is not to blame in being a scoundrel, as though that were any consolation to the scoundrel once he has come to realize that he actually is a scoundrel. But enough. Ech, I have talked a lot of nonsense, but what have I explained? How is enjoyment in this to be explained? But I will explain it. I will get to the bottom of it. That is why I have taken up my pen. I, for instance, have a great deal of amour propre. I am as suspicious and prone to take offense as a humpback or a dwarf, but upon my word I sometimes have had moments when if I had happened to be slapped in the face I should, perhaps, have been positively glad of it. I say, in earnest, that I should probably have been able to discover, even in that, a peculiar sort of enjoyment, the enjoyment of despair. But in despair there are the most intense enjoyments, especially when one is very acutely conscious of the hopelessness of one's position. And when one is slapped in the face, why then the consciousness of being rubbed into a pulp would positively overwhelm one? The worst of it is, look at it which way one will, it still turns out that I was always the most to blame in everything, and what is most humiliating of all, to blame for no fault of my own, but, so to say, through the laws of nature. In the first place, to blame because I am cleverer than any of the people surrounding me. I have always considered myself cleverer than any of the people surrounding me, and sometimes, would you believe it, have been positively ashamed of it. At any rate, I have all my life, as it were, turned my eyes away and never could look people straight in the face. To blame, finally, because even if I had had magnanimity, I should only have had more suffering from the sense of its uselessness. I should certainly have never been able to do anything from being magnanimous, neither to forgive, for my assailant would perhaps have slapped me from the laws of nature, and one cannot forgive the laws of nature, nor to forget, for even if it were owing to the laws of nature, it is insulting all the same. Finally, even if I had wanted to be anything but magnanimous, had desired on the contrary to revenge myself on my assailant, I could not have revenged myself on anyone for anything, because I should certainly never have made up my mind to do anything, even if I had been able to. Why should I not have made up my mind? About that in particular, I want to say a few words. 3. With people who know how to revenge themselves and to stand up for themselves in general, how is it done? Why, when they are possessed, let us suppose, by the feeling of revenge, then for the time there is nothing else but that feeling left in their whole being? Such a gentleman simply dashes straight for his object like an infuriated bull with its horns down, and nothing but a wall will stop him. By the way, facing the wall, such gentlemen, that is, the direct persons and men of action, are genuinely nonplussed. For them, a wall is not an evasion, as for us people who think and consequently do nothing. It is not an excuse for turning aside, an excuse for which we are always very glad, though we scarcely believe in it ourselves as a rule. No, they are nonplussed in all sincerity. The wall has for them something tranquilizing, morally soothing, final, maybe even something mysterious. But of the wall later. Well, such a direct person I regard as the real normal man, as his tender mother nature wished to see him when she graciously brought him into being on the earth. I envy such a man till I am green in the face. He is stupid. I am not disputing that, but perhaps the normal man should be stupid, how do you know? Perhaps it is very beautiful, in fact, and I am the more persuaded of that suspicion, if one can call it so, by the fact that if you take, for instance, the antithesis of the normal man, that is, the man of acute consciousness, who has come, of course, not out of the lap of nature, but out of a retort, 
This is almost mysticism, gentlemen, but I suspect this too. This retort-made man is sometimes so nonplussed in the presence of his antithesis that with all his exaggerated consciousness, he genuinely thinks of himself as a mouse and not a man. It may be an acutely conscious mouse, yet it is a mouse, while the other is a man, and therefore, etc., etc. And the worst of it is, he himself, his very own self, looks on himself as a mouse. No one asks him to do so, and that is an important point. Now let us look at this mouse in action. Let us suppose, for instance, that it feels insulted too, and it almost always does feel insulted, and wants to revenge itself too. There may even be a greater accumulation of spite in it than in l'homme de la nature et de la vérité. The base and nasty desire to vent that spite on its assailant rankles perhaps even more nastily in it than in l'homme de la nature et la de vérité. For through his innate stupidity, the latter looks upon his revenge as justice pure and simple, while in consequence of his acute consciousness, the mouse does not believe in the justice of it, to come at last to the deed itself, to the very act of revenge. Apart from the one fundamental nastiness the luckless mouse succeeds in creating around it so many other nastinesses in the form of doubts and questions, adds to the one question so many unsettled questions that there inevitably works up around it a sort of a fatal brew, a stinking mess, made up of its doubts, emotions, and of the contempt spat upon it by the direct men of action who stand solemnly about it as judges and arbitrators, laughing at it till their healthy sides ache. Of course, the only thing left for it is to dismiss all that with a wave of its paw, and, with a smile of assumed contempt in which it does not even itself believe, creep ignominiously into its mouse hole. There, in its nasty, stinking underground home, our insulted, crushed, and ridiculed mouse promptly becomes absorbed in cold, malignant, and above all everlasting spite. For forty years together it will remember its injury down to the smallest, most ignominious details, and every time will add, of itself, details still more ignominious, spitefully teasing and tormenting itself with its own imagination. It will itself be ashamed of its imaginings, but yet it will recall it all. It will go over and over every detail. It will invent unheard of things against itself, pretending that those things might happen, and will forgive nothing. Maybe it will begin to revenge itself, too, but, as it were, piecemeal, in trivial ways, from behind the stove, incognito, without believing either in its own right to vengeance or in the success of its revenge, knowing that from all its efforts at revenge it will suffer a hundred times more than he on whom it revenges itself, while he, I dare say, will not even scratch himself. On its deathbed it will recall it all over again, with interest accumulated over all the years, and... But it is just in that cold, abominable half-despair, half-belief, in that conscious burying oneself alive for grief in the underworld for forty years, in that acutely recognized and yet partly doubtful hopelessness of one's position, in that hell of unsatisfied desires turned inward, in that fever of oscillations, of resolutions determined forever and repented of again a minute later, that the savor of that strange enjoyment of which I have spoken lies. It is so subtle, so difficult of analysis, that persons who are a little limited, or even simply persons of strong nerves, will not understand a single atom of it. Possibly, you will add on your own account with a grin, people will not understand it either who have never received a slap in the face. And in that way, you will politely hint to me that I, too, perhaps, have had the experience of a slap in the face in my life, and so I speak as one who knows. I bet that you are thinking that.
But set your minds at rest, gentlemen. I have not received a slap in the face, though it is absolutely a matter of indifference to me what you may think about it. Possibly, I even regret, myself, that I have given so few slaps in the face during my life. But enough. Not another word on that subject of such extreme interest to you. I will continue calmly concerning persons with strong nerves who do not understand a certain refinement of enjoyment. Though in certain circumstances these gentlemen bellow their loudest like bulls, though this, let us suppose, does them the greatest credit, yet, as I have said already, confronted with the impossible, they subside at once. The impossible means the stone wall. What stone wall? Why, of course, the laws of nature, the deductions of natural science, mathematics. As soon as they prove to you, for instance, that you are descended from a monkey, then it is no use scowling, except it for a fact. When they prove to you that in reality one drop of your own fat must be dearer to you than a hundred thousand of your fellow creatures, and that this conclusion is the final solution of all so-called virtues and duties and all such prejudices and fancies, then you have just to accept it. There is no help for it, for twice two is a law of mathematics. Just try refuting it. Upon my word, they will shout at you, it is no use protesting. It is a case of twice two makes four. Nature does not ask your permission, she has nothing to do with your wishes, and whether you like her laws or dislike them, you are bound to accept her as she is, and consequently all her conclusions. A wall, you see, is a wall, and so on, and so on. Merciful heavens! But what do I care for the laws of nature and arithmetic, when, for some reason, I dislike those laws and the fact that twice two makes four? Of course, I cannot break through the wall by battering my head against it if I really have not the strength to knock it down, but I am not going to be reconciled to it simply because it is a stone wall and I have not the strength. As though such a stone wall really were a consolation, and really did contain some word of conciliation, simply because it is as true as twice two makes four. Oh, absurdity of absurdities! How much better it is to understand it all, to recognize it all, all the impossibilities and the stone wall, not to be reconciled to one of those impossibilities and stone walls if it disgusts you to be reconciled to it by the way of the most inevitable, logical combinations to reach the most revolting conclusions on the everlasting theme, that even for the stone wall you are yourself somehow to blame, though, again, it is as clear as day you are not to blame in the least, and therefore grinding your teeth and silent impotence to sink into luxurious inertia, brooding on the fact that there is no one even for you to feel vindictive against, that you have not, and perhaps never will, have an object for your spite, that it is a sleight of hand, a bit of juggling, a card sharper's trick, that it is simply a mess, no knowing what and no knowing who, but in spite of all these uncertainties and jugglings, still there is an ache in you, and the more you do not know, the worse the ache.